Okay, so here we are, last example question in the course. So for this last one, I thought we'd go big because, uh, well, well, why not? Because we are code, we've built a computer program that will analyze whatever structure we throw into it. And um, so let's try and throw something uh, a little bit big into it and see, see how it does. And of course it handles it absolutely fine. The biggest effort when you're doing something like this is actually um, it's actually what you see in front of you, working out all of the nodal uh, numbering um, and breaking the thing down into a number of nodes. That's where all the work actually is and inputting it into your code. So when you look at something like this, you start to think, right, well, it's all well and good having a code like this. And of course, we've we've massively increased our understanding of matrix methods of analysis. But in terms of practicality, um, you know, using this on large structures, how practical is it? You can really see that the, uh, the benefits that a commercial software package will offer you because it won't ask you to input all of these individual nodes individually. You will just put in, um, you'll just identify a node at the start of a column here, let's say, and at the end of a column, or perhaps all the way up at the end of this column, and your software, well, not your software, the commercial software will break that down into a number of nodes. Now, technically, there's nothing, there's nothing too difficult about that, and that's, again, something that you might do and develop on um, after this course, you might take this code as a starting point and further develop it uh, and build in some functionality to um, to allow the user to basically input key nodal positions um, or the nodes defining the ends of structural members and then get the code to break it up and generate all these node numbers. That's a very worthwhile addition on top of on top of this uh, on top of this course, which uh, I'd recommend you do. It's not really to do with the stiffness method, and so that's why I've not included it in the course. But I'd recommend you take a look at that. Definitely worthwhile because I can tell you it took me quite a while to, to basically work my way through all this and generate the graphic. All right, so what have we got then? We've got the, we've got a frame for a sort of a semi high rise building here. We've got some loads coming on here, kind of you know, mimicking a wind loading that's increasing in magnitude as we go up the building. We've got some uniformly distributed loads here sort of scattered throughout the throughout the structure. You might have, uh, you might call these balconies, that's what they might be on either end of this tower structure. We've thrown some spring supports in here because well, because why not? Because you know, our code can handle it. So let's, let's make these springs. Now in terms of how I've defined the structure, I've defined it in the same order that the nodes are laid out. And so I've defined this column or rather all of these, yeah, this single column all the way up here. I've defined then this column this column and then this column and th this is in terms of my member definitions how the order in which i've defined my members then i've defined all the members making up this horizontal level this level this level and so on and so forth all the way until we get up to the last level up here so that's the order in which i've defined each of these elements within the structure so i've i'm not going to type this in now obviously i've typed it in previously um, and let me tell you, that was a, a laborious exercise. So it's done, and um, all I'm going to do is really just show it to you now. Um, so I've broken up my structured data entry into nodes, members, and then the loading and restraints. So if I look at my nodes, first of all, if I reveal that, um, you can see I've basically just input all of my nodes, and there's quite a lot there. You can see that's why I've broken it down. Uh, and I've also I've also included a label alongside each node so we can see and the bigger your structure gets if you're using a code like this the bigger your structure gets the more important these labels become because several times I had to I had to come back uh, and reference um, the, the various different labels for whatever reason. So um, that's all of my nodes entered. Again, you, you know, I can't emphasize enough, it really is worth considering how you can write a small algorithm, a small addition to this notebook to get it to do this work for you rather than you doing it. So there's our nodes. Then we've got our members defined. And again, these, these are particularly important, uh, these labels identifying the different elements within my structure. Uh, and I've also numbered the elements as well. So again, very, very well worth doing. So I'll collapse that and we we'll take a look at the loading and restraints. So this is the bit you're used to. So we can expand this now and look at the various different uh, values that we've put in here. So again, I'm just scooting down through this. I'll zoom back in here so you can see it a little bit better. So we've got the, the normal uh, constant values. We have no pins in this particular model. We have our restrained degrees of freedom. We have our spring or sprung degrees of freedom. I've included a stiffness here. I've, I've basically just got them quite stiff at the minute. We then have our horizontal point loads coming on. And I've just, I've just included as a, as a 
comment here, the, the scheme essentially, which allows you to identify which of these uh, degrees of freedom or these degree of freedom numbers. But again, as I said many times, if you've made it this far in the course, you uh, shouldn't have any issue identifying which degree of freedom corresponds to which node number. Okay, so what else have we got? Then we just have our uniformly distributed loads defined. So there's a number of uniformly distributed loads, and so we've got four sets of them defined, noting that we have, if we look at level one here, and the uniformly distributed loads for level one, they're all a single model of fixed fixed for each element. But when we go to the higher levels, we have uh, members that have a pin on either end. So if I scroll back up here, we have the member on the very end here, or the node or the element on the very end here will have a pin on the left. Similarly, the element on the end over here will have a pin on the right, and we have those represented down here as well for each level. All right, so that's the data entry. We can go ahead and run this now. and see what we get. All right, so it's run. So I've I've increased the plot size just because I, I wanted to see a bigger picture. And again, you can make any, any and all tweaks that you want to this. Let me zoom out here so you guys can see it. So that's our deflected shape. Very, very gratifying, I think, to see uh, when you've written all the code to build this thing. It's very gratifying to see it in action and see it simulating the deflected shape for this structure. Another great addition you might consider adding on to the end of this notebook would be to animate this. That would be pretty cool to be able to see this thing animate backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards in response to the loads. Um, I haven't done it uh, in this course, but I think I probably might do it um, if I was in your shoes. Scrolling down, what have we got then? We have our axial force diagram, um, and we can do all the usual things like putting on uh, the labels. We notice here that there's no axial force in the right-hand balconies because these axial forces, or rather these horizontal forces, are coming onto the left-hand side of the structure, and so these balconies are going into compression. Um, and that those forces are being taken down into the structure. So there's no force transmitted out into the balconies on the right hand side here. Um, we have our bending moment diagram. And again, you're going to need to play around with the scales here to make sure you can see these bending moment diagrams. Um, so we might increase our scale. OK, and we start to see a, a nice frame bending moment diagram. And again, we have the exact same thing for a shear force diagram. Uh, and then, of course, you've got a, a mass of text output. So realistically, this is probably where you're going to go to find out the values that you want, rather than looking at labels, tiny labels on these diagrams. You would refer to your the top, where you've got all of your node numbers identified. And then you would go down, probably, and look through your text output to see the various different values that you, you need to find for whatever reason. So one other thing that's worth uh, worth playing around with before we wrap this one up is um, playing around with these spring supports down here. So you can see what kind of deflection we've got here. So if we were to go ahead and let's imagine we softened up this support here, we'd expect it to have a big, big impact on the deflection of this structure. So let's go ahead and play around with that and see what it does. So let's go back up here. So that was our third spring support. So let us, let's go and soften that up a bit. 0.001, uh, soften it up a lot just, just to really go to the extremes and see what it does. And sure enough, we can see a massive impact on deflection. So it's, it's really just a toy example here, really, um, just softening this thing up. Uh, but you can see that vertical drop in deflection or that, yeah, that vertical drop in the support here has had a huge impact on the deflection. Um, so of course that, that, that unleashes a whole host of engineering questions and challenges and all sorts of interesting stuff, which we're not going to go into, but I just wanted to demonstrate um, the, the the impact of let's of softening up one of these supports. So there you have it. That is it. That's we're done. We've we've completed our code, we've run plenty of structures through it. And um, now it's over to you basically to build on this um, and expand it and add more features and add more functionality. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed the course. We'll come back again in the very final lecture here just for a couple of closing comments and a quick a quick debrief on, on what we achieved in the course. Okay, so we'll leave that there for now and come back after a quick break for our final lecture.